Tonight we'll be having our 26th lesson in Genesis. That means we've been here for a year. <laughs> so I think the Lord's been good to us in it. Amen. Tonight we're going to be going over the 17th chapter of Genesis. And this is the record of the Lord's third appearance to Abraham. And when Abram was 99 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, Behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceedingly exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Notice, as soon as he changed his name, he started calling him by that, that new name. Uh -huh. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and thee and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in thy house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with, with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and I will give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety-nine years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. 
And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the self same day as God had said unto him. And Abram was ninety nine, ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the self same day was Abram circumcised and Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house born in the house and bought with money of a stranger were circumcised with him. Now we're being introduced to faith. The, a person, faith is going to be defined by a person. It always obeys instantly. Mm -hmm. Amen. I say faith always obeys instantly. Now to this point, more, more of God's revealed in this text than had been previously also. To this point, God's revealed himself to Abram, Ab Abram, and here's what he's told him. He said he, he was a shield, his exceeding great reward, the Lord Jehovah, and in this text, the Almighty God. Right? That's, that's the sum of what, that is the sum of what Abram, Abram knows about God. And he acted about it. See, the, I'm showing you that just, just the smallest amount of accurate knowledge of God, just the smallest amount, is enough to motivate a person to do whatever God tells them to do. It's illustrated right here. We don't have to speculate about this. It's right here it is. Live it out for us. So if you know people who think they know a lot about God but aren't obeying them, they aren't telling the truth. They don't know a lot about God. That's why they don't obey Him. That's the truth of the matter. Well, they may be able to quote some text to you and this sort of thing, but it's just, it's just, yep. Mm -hmm. They really are unacquainted. They're fundamentally unacquainted with God. Fundamentally unacquainted with God. That's why they don't obey Him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Now, he's going to introduce for the first time in this text the name Jehovah. The revelation of the name Jehovah is represented as Lord with capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's the word Jehovah. And, that, and I'll explain why they did. You say, why did they do that? Well, the Jewish people, they were, af they were afraid to write God's name. And I give an explanation here for why they were. They... It was more than just take name in vain. They were as afraid that they wrote it and made a mistake. It was a sin to erase it and go backwards. In fact, the modern day rabbis have ruled that writing the name of God on a computer is not a transgression because you, you, it is provision made. You don't have to erase it, so to speak. You see, well, that doesn't sound, that sounds kind of absurd, no? That, that sounds like someone who really believed they're dealing with God. Amen. That's what that sounds like to me. Uh -huh. See, and I see translators and Bible quote scholars tampering with the Word of God. That, that's telling me something. Yeah, that's right. These people are strangers to God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm dogmatic about this, and I think I could support this fully, even in a public venue could support that, that that's the reason they're so sloppy is they're, they're fundamentally unacquainted with God. Once you know who God is, you act like Abraham. If God says go, you go. Amen. Amen. You do it right away. It's written that Abram called in the name of the Lord, it's got capital letters, which was Jehovah. And God said to Abram, I am the Lord, those capital letters again. Jehovah, Jehovah. Now, that appears to contradict something that was said to Moses by God. It appears on the surface to contradict it. So I want to deal briefly with this. 
This is found in Exodus 3, 13. He speaks to Moses about how he revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, shall I say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you? And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you, and this is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. I also told Moses that he hadn't revealed himself to Abram in this capacity. And that is, uh, that's where the thorn comes in. The word Jehovah means the self-existent eternal one. All right, that's, that's a concept that no human can grasp. That's outside the circumference of human experience. It's like eternal. This, this is a concept men can't grasp. And God revealed the eternal self exists. There's not even any language that has a word that says this, this way. So it's important to uh, have a concept of an eternal God. See, there's, I'm afraid that much of what parades itself as Christianity does not have a concept of an eternal God. I, I know this is because they're anchored to the earth. They're not seeking eternal life. They're not seeking an eternal inheritance, which means they don't know yet about an eternal God. They're just like the Athenians and the Stoics, but they're sitting in churches, but they're the same kind of people. Yeah. They have not, they do not know God's eternal. If you ask them on a test, they'd say he's eternal, but their mind can't wrap itself around it. Because once you see that, once you see your temporal and he's eternal, you subject yourself to him immediately when you see it. As with anyone in scripture that knowingly confronted God, oh, well, they prostrated themselves before God and whatever he said they did, they didn't rebel. That's because this concept come across to them. <clears throat> now our text says that Abram was 99 years old when God appeared to him. This isn't uh, the way men would do it. In fact, they would tell you that this doesn't work. This would not work to wait till a man had lived most of his 40, above 40% 40 of his life and was lived before the first appearance. Now he's lived about 68% of his life and God appears to him again. So most people would say that that won't work. You, you, got, you got to start when they're young. Well, under normal circumstances, I understand that's true, but this God never did do that. Well, with the possible exception of Samuel. And then he was a, he was a servant. He, he served the Lord. He wasn't uh, any active teaching role or anything like that. In fact, when he first heard from the Lord, he didn't know the Lord. He was just telling you, he didn't know the Lord. He couldn't, wasn't able to recognize his voice. Even though he was being raised up in the tabernacle, he, did, he couldn't recognize it. So this is the way God works. This is the way men work. I understand this is the way men work, but this isn't the way God works. Amen. And the results of this trend should tell people something. Now, the fact that he worked, he worked with Abram when he was old. He worked with Noah when he was old. Yeah. <laughs> he worked with Zacharias and Elizabeth when they were old. Mothers of John, father of John the Baptist. He worked with the dedication of Jesus with an old man. This is, this is the way God works. What do you learn from this? 
Now, this is consistent through Scripture. We don't have to apologize to anybody for this. The concept, it's wrong to have an emphasis on youth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, as I said, emphasis. Yeah, that's right. It's wrong to have an emphasis on youth. The concept of the church of tomorrow, that's not in the Bible. That's man's idea. That's not that's God's right. idea. That's right. God talks to the church of today. Yes. Yeah. People talk about the church tomorrow. They're lazy. That's why they do that. Yes. They're not doing anything for God. That's why they talk that way. Huh? Mm -hmm. They're just occupying a few and sitting there. That, mm -hmm. These aren't the people that do the work that is done with the youth. The people say this. They're the on watchers. Yeah. I know this is the way it is. I've been around this. Yeah. This is the way it is. But this is a wrong emphasis. And if you challenge it, you'll be, you'll be viewed as inconsiderate. But so be it. This doesn't mean you neglect the youth. I understand that. We shouldn't even have to say that. Uh -huh. We're living that out. Someone says, no one has ever charged this assembly with neglecting the youth. Anyone that comes here, nobody says, well, you really have neglected your young people. Nobody yeah. that ever came here has ever said that. Uh -huh. He said, we don't neglect them at all. But that's not our emphasis. It's we're not going to shape the work of the church around young people. We aren't going to do it. Mm -hmm. We're going to prepare them to be involved with the, yes, with the work of the church. And that's, what, that's what's being done. Now let's move on with this. The Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, I am the Almighty God. Now that's the first time in the Bible the word Almighty is mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's not mentioned in the first 16 chapters. Almighty. First time. The Hebrew expression Shaddai, you probably, there was a song, El Shaddai. Shaddai, that's, that's the word for this. Means most powerful. Now this is a fun, fundamentally foundational view of God, almighty. You can't think of anything God can't do. Or a situation over which he cannot preside. Or a situation he cannot control. God is almighty. Almighty. The natural man can't comprehend that. Mighty, or he has some... The natural man has some idea about mighty, but almighty doesn't have any idea about that. Because as I have said, it extends beyond human experience. Now the word almighty is referred to God. It always refers to God. Nobody else is ever called almighty. It's used 57 times in the scripture. So it's a common expression. And then the new covenant is even used there. For instance, notice the context, how it's used. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and will be a father in you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you get the Almighty part firm in your mind, and you go to work on this other part. Yes, if the Almighty eludes you, then you, you ignore yeah. what he said. In the Revelation, Jesus identified himself to John. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is, as was, which is to come. The Almighty. He comes over that. In other words, you don't get off first base till you see this. Amen. This is foundational, Almighty. That means you've got to do a lot of preaching, a lot of teaching, a lot of talking about God to confirm this, that he is Almighty. The scriptural record does confirm this. There are four living creatures that are around the throne. They're exalted personalities. We don't know a lot about them. But they're depicted as saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There it is again. Twenty-four elders. They're around the throne, close proximity to the throne. They say, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty. And John saw the, vict the souls that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, over the mark of his name. And he heard them singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. They were singing, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. There it is again. John saw the exalted Christ. 
sword coming out of his mouth. He shall smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth out the winepress of the fiercest of the wrath of Almighty God. Here we have the picture of at the end. Revelation 21, 22. He saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb of the temple of it. All right, that's one thing to read about that here. But think about Abraham. God revealed that yeah. aspect of his nature to Abraham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. It'll challenge you to think about Almighty. It's, it'll, it'll challenge you. Almighty. So it's marvelous that God revealed himself. Mm -hmm. I am God Almighty. It's like he's saying, what I'm going to tell you is going to call for all might. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is not going to be something that you could work out or do yourself. It's, it's not that sort of thing at all. Now, if this is true, and it is that God is almighty, then those who trust in God have a right to be confident. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. We're, we're trusted in this. The prospects are bright because God's going to do what he's determined and he's told us what he's determined to do. Mm -hmm. So you're discouraged. You need to do a lot of thinking about the almighty God. You need to do a lot of thinking about that. There's a lot in scripture about it. Mm -hmm. You need to ponder it. I'm the almighty God, Abram, Abraham. Now the fact that I reveal this to you uh, something else I got to tell you now. When I divulge this to you, you've got to have a proper response. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah. yeah, nobody can do that. You don't want to tell God that. Mm -hmm. huh? Would you tell God, nobody can do that, God? God said, walk before me and be perfect. Would you retaliate and say, I can't do that. <laughs> well, some people do say that. They don't say it in their prayers, but they do say it. But it's not true. God doesn't ask you to do something you can't do. Amen. You'll have to rely on Him. I understand that. You have to rely on Him to do it. This is how God talks to a person that He's carrying out a conversation with. He expects that person to shape up. Uh -huh. Amen. If a person wants to have a, live a sloppy life, an inconsiderate life, not pay attention to God, just get set for this. God's not going to talk to you. God doesn't hold conversations with people like that. Unless it's Cain, and that wasn't a happy conversation. Walk before me. Be perfect. To walk before the Lord is to live with an acute consciousness of Him. You're always aware of the fact that you're under God's eye. You always know it. Stated in a new covenant language, the same thing would be said, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That would be stated in a new covenant language, live with a conscious awareness of God. This is why we're always concerned when people are drawn away by distractions. It's the kind of thing you can't pass laws, but it bothers us when we see it, whether it's in ourselves or someone else. There's someone that really just really kind of going off these little dog trails of life. And, and you can walk down them without paying attention to God, and you can say, well, there's nothing in the Bible against that, and that's true. But there is something in the Bible against not walking before God. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah, but isn't this one of the things that God was displeased with Solomon about? Oh, yes. He had appeared to him twice. Twice. And so he, had, his, he should have had a greater, that's right. a greater uh, understanding of God's ways. That's right. Job had an amazing understanding of God's ways. That's right. Mm -hmm. As far as we know, he never appeared to him until after the test. Until after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was faith again, see? Yes. Yeah. There was faith again. He knew who he was dealing with. Job did. And God himself testified that Job spoke of me what is right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And Solomon, he forgot. Yes. 
His, his heart was carried away with his wives. His wives carried his heart away. He loved them so much he built idol uh, houses for their idols. And he instituted idolatry. So those who trust in God have a right to be confident and to live conscious of God. And that's something that you can't pass a law that makes this happen. You can't even do it with your children. <laughs> you can't even make your children live with always thinking about you. Sometimes you say, you remember, you know, you... But they... That's not, you have to tell them that, I understand, but that's not how it's really accomplished. It's accomplished by insight. Yes, amen. There comes a day when the child sees who you really are. Mm -hmm. That you're more than someone that puts their arm around them. Yeah. You're the one taking care of them and all this. So when they see this, it, it changes. Yes, Brother Tony. Right. Uh, God asked Abraham, he told Abraham to walk before me perfect. Now, he's going to enable Abraham to do this because, oh, yes. like you said, he's, he's, he's walking in, uh, in awareness of God. He's mm -hmm. God conscious. They can be perfect before him that way. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. See, there's a, there's a moral responsibility to those who follow God or follow Christ. You, you can't have God and ignore his requirements. This, you can't. Mm -hmm. After all said and done, you can't. That wasn't true. Cain could have continued on with with God. Any communication with God carries with it certain responsibilities. So let's say you're growing. Let's say you're growing in your understanding, which many many of you are. Let's say you're growing in your understanding. You see more. All right, you got to live more. This has to impact your life. It has to translate into your life. With it, it, just as surely you said it to Abram, Abram, he said it to you. Walk before me and be perfect. Are you. I've, I've humbled myself, so to speak, I speak as a man, I've humbled myself to speak to you and deliver these promises to you, and I expect you never to forget me Amen. and walk before me. There's not a lot of this being said today, brethren. In fact, a, a God's being presented that you don't have to remember. He'll, he'll take care of whatever you forget, he'll take yeah. care of. There's a sense in which I know there's a sense in which that is true. But God never has called anyone to a morally neutral state. By morally, I mean you're deciding yes and no, right and wrong. He's never called anyone to a morally neutral state where you didn't have to decide which way, decide what to say, decide what to do, decide who to serve. He didn't call you to a state that relieved you of that. Walk before me and be perfect. Being perfect... In this case, would mean no knowledgeable flaw. Mm -hmm. You get up high enough, God sees flaws in everybody. I understand that, but he's, this isn't how he's talking here. Yeah. He's talking about as far as your conscience is concerned, as so far as your effort is concerned, your total life is mine. Mm -hmm. And all you know about Abraham, that's how he lived. Yeah. That's how he lived. His total life belonged to God. There isn't any account of him being involved in anything else. Other than serving God, the one thing that might qualify for a diversion is when he fought those kings. That's about it. The rest of the record doesn't, and then it was for to deliver somebody. Uh -huh. Dude, from this side of the cross, we've been called into fellowship of God's Son. Uh -huh. But that fellowship is a demanding fellowship. Amen. It means what God, what Jesus teaches you, you've got to remember. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't have the opposition of putting it in the back of your mind or forgetting it. Mm -hmm. Not what Jesus teaches you. You've got to keep mm -hmm. his yeah. word. Amen. And it's to dwell in your heart richly. Uh -huh. and, and God expects fruit from this. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's not going to make an investment of you and settle for getting zero back. As a parable of talents and the pounds. Amen. Right, Kevin, you remember when Jesus was teaching his disciples and he said, Do you beware of the leaven of the Pharisees? Yeah, that's right. Repair it. 
And they said, he said this because we didn't take any bread with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember what Jesus did? He did a little review. Yeah. <laughs> Went back over the feeding of the 5,000 and the yeah. 4,000. Because like you said, he expected you, while you were distributing yeah, that, to right. learn something about yeah, God right. while you were doing it. And if they had learned it, they'd have been ready to answer that yeah, question. Right. Amen. Amen. Now this kind of thing is actually impossible. Keep what Jesus told us. Uh -huh. That's actually impossible to do on our own. Yeah. But now with Jesus working with this, and we got to work at it, we can actually do this. That's right. Amen. Yeah, I don't know that you have any guarantee that if you don't use the thing Jesus showed you yesterday, that you're going to get anything new today. That's right. But again, that's where, like what you've uh, been teaching in Ephesians, where Paul prayed that we may be strengthened in our inner man. That's right. That Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. So as He's dwelling in us, then then we have we have the, we know Him and we keep these things. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. This transforms yeah. a person's concept of the assembly. Mm -hmm. Amen. This transforms it. <coughs> now, even when Abraham, Abraham had no part at all in the initiation of this covenant. His hand wasn't on this covenant so far as initiating it was concerned. It wasn't like the old covenant. Yeah, that's right. It was different. The old covenant, I had a talk with a good brother recently about this, who was of the persuasion that the Ten Commandments were the covenant. They're called the words of the covenant, but they were not the old covenant. The covenant was the agreement. Yeah, this yeah. will we do. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That was the covenant. He, God said, this is, this is what's got to be done. Mm -hmm. It was contingent upon them agreeing mm -hmm. to do it. When they agreed to do it, mm -hmm. that was the covenant. Amen. At that point, yeah. Moses took blood wow. and water and sprinkled the book and the people. Yeah. Yeah. That's, right. that's what the covenant was. Right. It's got to be clear in people's mind. I come from a background where the Old Covenant was the Ten Commandments and was nailed to the cross. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But the Old Covenant wasn't the Ten Commandments, that were the words of the Covenant. Uh -huh. yeah. The Covenant was the agreement. Yeah. All that He has said, we will do. Yeah. And when they didn't, that broke yeah. the Covenant. <clears throat> now it's important to bring up at this time what Paul said about this text we're reading. He says it was the gospel. This is found in Galatians 3.18. This I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which is 430 years after, cannot disannul, and it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be by the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Notice the covenant is called a promise. The old covenant was not a promise. Right. Mm -hmm. You see, the, uh -huh, yeah. with the new covenant, this was the new covenant in embryo. Mm -hmm. Amen. It was a covenant of blessing. That's the thing that he revealed to yeah. to uh, Abraham. Now, writing on this, Paul said this: <clears throat> For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till a seed should come, to whom the promise was made, and was ordained in the hands of a mediator. In verse 8 he says, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these should all nations be blessed. So that was <laughs> that was the gospel in embryo. That was it. Here it is announced to Abram a promise, all families of the earth. This means that the opening of the door to the faith of the Gentiles was not an afterthought. That's right. All right, there's a theology that says when the Jews rejected yeah, yeah. God, God stopped the prophetic time clock yeah. and opened the door to the Gentiles. This is not so. Yeah. Amen. This is not so. He, some of them were cut off. Mm -hmm. Not all of them. Some of them. We know this is true because Jesus, when he was on earth, said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I must bring, that they sh and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold of one shepherd. So that was, uh, 
He knew that God's all along had intended to bring in the Gentiles all along. Amen. I really give it. I like this. He says it in the embryo form because the embryo is the real, genuine thing. It just does not fully. Not it's, not, it's not birthed yet. Mm -hmm. right. But but it, it, that's why Abraham had the same faith. Amen. And we have the same faith as Abraham because it was yeah. technically the same covenant. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, I like this. Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him. I just, that language just kind of thrills my soul. He fell on his face, face down, prostrated himself. It's just kind of been the manner of God's people throughout history. Moses, he hid his face before the angels of the Lord. Moses fell down before the Lord. The children of Israel fell on their face when the glory of God was revealed. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face. And Manoah and his wife fell on their faces. And the children of Israel fell on their faces when the fire of the Lord consumed Elijah's sacrifice. Ezekiel fell on his face when he had visions of God. And Daniel fell on his face before the Lord. Peter, James, and John fell on their face when Jesus was transfigured and a voice spoke out of heaven to him. Saul of Tarsus fell to the ground. Paul posed a hypothetical case where a stranger came into the assembly, detected God was there, fell on his face. John fell as a dead man before the glorified Christ. John fell twice at the feet of an angel. So this is the this is the manner throughout Scripture that when people confront, knowingly confront God, they aren't rebels anymore. They fall down. Now, everyone's going to do this when Jesus comes again. Everybody's going to fall down, bend the knee, confess He's Lord, for some will be under condemnation. Now, and men and Adam, there was a certain enmity that developed between them and God. It's reflected in this falling down before the Lord. It's reflected in that. Men philosophize sometimes about disobeying God and what happens and this sort of thing. But when God shows himself as he really is, this rebellion this refusal to bow stops. Yeah. Amen. It won't because their character won't be changed to the day of judgment that it won't change things for them. Now I wanted to say a word about the present state of the professed church, which I believe is in a blinded state. What's the difference between Abram? And he was Abram at the beginning of this chapter. What is the difference between Abram and this present generation? Is this, he was aware of the presence of God, and they are not. Amen. Oh, they say they are. They say that if they sing a certain way and sing a certain length of time and have a certain kind of intonation to God, that it creates a portal, is what they say. A portal, and God comes through that portal right down into their presence. <laughs> I think they ought to join up with the Hindus. That's where I'm more like a Hindu philosophy. Yeah. The idea isn't God coming down to you. He already did that once in Christ. The idea is going up. Amen. Drawing near to Him. Yeah. That's the concept of yeah. Christian worship. See, so there's a concept, brother, and you've got to see this. There's a concept of worship that has been introduced in our day that is 100% fabricated. Yeah. It's not real. Uh -huh. And it's based upon an erroneous idea about God. God talked with Abram. Some verses say he went on talking with him. I said it was an extended conversation. The idea is that God first addressed Abram. He fell on the ground and God kept on which means Abraham wasn't unconscious. That's right. He wasn't, as they say, slain in the spirit. Yeah. The process they have to work this stuff out in their own minds. Well, I tell you, it does have to be worked out. His body was on the ground, but his mind was active. God doesn't talk to people that don't understand and don't know what's going on. 
Now there's a principle to be seen here. Productive, productive associations with God are always within the framework of knowing God mm -hmm. and being aware of his purpose. Yeah. That's what's happened here to Abraham. He knew, knew God, didn't know him fully, we understand, but he knew something of God and knew it was his purpose. Mm -hmm. And in that context, God yeah. talked to him. God said, uh, as for me, interesting statement, yeah. as for me, other versions say, behold, some say, it is I, some say, I am, some say, and I, for my part, lo, this is my part of our agreement, the English Revised Version says. In other words, as for me, they're translated from a single word. And the word is stressed, it stresses an emphasis. It's like he's saying, pay attention to me, what I'm... What I'm saying now is the main thing. As for me, which means nothing else counts at this point. You've seen that, haven't you? Yeah. You have a moment with the Lord, spend a time with the Lord, you don't want any interruptions. See? You seem to sense that <coughs> this is not the time for my mind to be flitting here and there. As for me, I'm appearing to you to let you know what I'm doing, Abram. Abraham, that's why I've appeared to you. Yeah. As for me, that contradicts directly the English Revised Version. Mm -hmm. This is not a statement that God saying, "This is now. This is my part. And I'm going to tell you what your part is." That's not what it's saying at all. Right. Now let's be clear about this. <clears throat> the promise of a coming seed had no conditions that men were to fulfill. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't conditioned on anything Abraham would do mm -hmm. or had done. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now we shouldn't be surprised at this. There are things like this in the scripture that have nothing whatsoever to do with what men do. They're just scheduled or on the schedule or going to happen. Doesn't make any difference what men do. Here's some of them. The coming of Jesus in the form of a servant. That <laughs> that came at a scheduled time didn't have anything to do with what anybody did. Uh -huh. yeah. Or the death of Jesus, that came at a said scheduled time, didn't have, wasn't, it didn't have, men were involved, but it didn't cause it to happen, they couldn't stop it from happening, Amen. it was just on schedule. The, mm -hmm. the resurrection of Jesus, that, that happened three days later, there was a, anything that could stop that. Yeah. Uh, see, it was, a, it was something that God does, it was a contingent upon anything man did. Yeah. And the ascension of Jesus, that wasn't conditioned on anything anybody on earth did. Or the exaltation of Jesus, that was, that was unconditional. Or the institution of the new covenant, that was unconditional. The day of Pentecost was fully came, it started off, that was it, didn't make any difference if men ready or not. That happened, they were, they got, Jesus told them what to do, but it, came on when the day of Pentecost has fully come, it set in motion. Yeah. How about the second coming of Christ? That is not, you can't like stall it That's right. or make it come later or something like this or the end of the world. That's something's fixed in time or the final demise of the devil. There's a time schedule and they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire. The day of judgment or the appearance of new heavens and new earth. See, those are all things God does that are absolutely and totally unconditional. They're just what he scheduled, and the coming of a seed into the world is in that category. Didn't make any difference if Herod tried to stop it, it's going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. See? Amen. Whether Jerusalem wasn't uh, looking for it, it's going to happen anyway. Amen. I was thinking about that day of Pentecost, how that event changed everybody's plans. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There was quite a few people that had some plans. I'm sure. That's right. Yeah, they heard this and they had to, had to go and say, we heard, we heard something's going on over at this house. There was a lot of places where they were celebrating, I guess, but, but something was really happening over there where they were at. Behold my covenant. See, God is introducing to Abraham things that are not conditioned upon any human input at all. Yeah. Right. I'm giving you a promise that is not 
conditioned upon any input from men at all. Well, they had to have a child. It was a miraculous child. Don't forget. Right. <laughs> Don't forget what kind of child it was. But again, this kind of thinking also encourages us not to be consumed with the circumstances of life. Yeah. That's right. At any time, Abraham could have been absorbed with giving up Isaac, you know, or leaving yeah. his family. Could have been just absorbed in himself and circumstances. But the knowledge of these kind of things encourages you that there's some there's something greater going on than even just what God's doing with just you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Behold, my covenant is with thee. For the Lord's shaping our thinking. Accustoming us to being God-centered. You see that? Is just, he's he's a, familiarizing us with that way of thinking. God later will reveal to Abraham that he's determined to bless all the nations of the earth. He's not going to put it on hold. There's going to be a situation that will stall it. Is going to happen. Further, Abram is going to participate in this, but not until his body was reproductively dead. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he, he couldn't he couldn't play a role in this until he couldn't play a role in it. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you were saved. Yes. You were saved when it dawned on you there wasn't anything you could do about it yourself. Amen. That's, this is how God works. Yeah, amen. So if he appeared to Abraham when he was 35, you know, he probably could have mm -hmm. said, well, there's no problem. Well, I'll have the offspring, sir. We'll have the offspring. No problem. That's not how God works. Mm -hmm. He waited till it was impossible. Amen. Then he announced it. All right, there's a classic illustration of not of works, lest any man should boast. There's a... Now, now that the work is underway, God has to change Abram, Abram's name. Your name, neither shall any more your name be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abram, for a father of many nations have made thee. Now this is, uh, as the time draws near for the promised heir to be born, there's more revealed about this. We've talked about this before, but it's good to briefly mention it again. That that's a divine manner. As, his, as the time for divine appointments draw near, God unveils more about them. At the time Israel's deliverance drew near, revelation and understanding was given you know, to Moses about it. And I won't name the others. You're familiar with these uh, cases. So now the time is about here for the promised heir to be born. So now he announces how this is going to happen. I'd say that he had, uh, he had announced this at the front end. When he first called him out of Haran, I said he announced then that Sarah's going to have a child. Well, after 25 years, he'd have he, he nearly fainted. Yeah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah, right. He didn't tell him Sarah's going to have it till one year before. Amen. Till the year before. Right. I'm not sure it was just one year. Uh -huh. Could have been just exactly nine months, too. Uh -huh. But he just, just till he, that's what he announced. This, he didn't know till he was 99 that his wife was going to be the one to right. give birth to the heir. Things that's happened in our lives too, like if the Lord would have told us something that we would do, we would we would we yeah. were gonna do yeah. you know, ten years from now, then we might not we might have fainted, like you said, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. he waits until the time and then he says, Do this. That's right. Because the understanding is critical yeah. to your walk with God. <laughs> understanding is critical. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to understand something before it's time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I give him a new name, Abram. Abraham. Abram means exalted father or a high father. And the name Abraham means father of multiple. Very high father. It sounds on the surface like it almost means the same thing. But it doesn't. If that name hadn't been changed, it would give a reason to think Ishmael could have been the seed, see. 
Well, there are many nations, I asked me, oh, many nations, see? Yes. So that would have given the Muslims just cause to focus on Ishmael. But he changed his name because the seed was going to be, the seed was going to come from Isaac. And he would have had many, he had many children, you know, after Isaac, several children after Isaac. Father, many nations have I made thee. I made thee. You wouldn't even have had one son, yeah. let alone nations come from you. So in Ishmael, Abram was also the father of a great nation. But a nation sprang from Keturah's sons, six of them as well. But the nations God's talking about, <laughs> that's going to come from Isaac. And ultimately the nations are going to be called at the end of time the nations of the saved, as Revelation 21, 24. That is to say, out of every nation that's ever lived, there's going to be a remnant. Yeah, that's right. That sanctified the nation on earth, yeah. but is going to be represented in the glory by yeah. these nations of the saved. Some generations that God allows to to be here only for this remnant that's going to that's come right. out. And kings will come out of thee. Well, there's you know we could name some Solomon, David, Jehoshaphat, Josiah, Hezekiah, some Gentile will as well. Abram, now he wasn't a king, but kings came out of him. Yeah. <laughs> so you can produce something bigger than you. Yeah. All right? Something to ponder. Yeah, yeah. And he said, I'm going to establish my covenant. Now I'm going to establish my covenant between me and you. God refers to my covenant to Abraham 14 times, with 13 of them being in the 17th chapter. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you suppose he's emphasizing? Yeah. <laughs> my covenant. Not our covenant. Yeah. My covenant. In the history of the world, no man has ever instituted a covenant with God. And then the closest thing you get to was Hannah. If you give me a child, I'll, I'll lend him to you for as long as he'll live. That'd be the closest, I suppose, you'd come to it. But covenants are always initiated by God. God made a covenant with Noah, too, but it was of a lower order. It was a covenant of what he wouldn't do, not what he would do. He made a covenant he wouldn't destroy the world. But that that's not the nature of the new covenant. And the covenant made with Abraham is not what God wouldn't do. It's what he yep. would do. Amen. And when he says, I'll establish my covenant, that was the idea was it was a permanent covenant. It was not going to pass away. It was not going to be supplanted or replaced by another covenant. Now this isn't the way he talked to Israel. The covenant made with Israel was a condition, conditional covenant. He said, Leviticus 26, 3, if you, walk, if you walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them, then, then, I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant. You <laughs> see, there was a conditional covenant. You had to do this before you get that. But that's not the kind of covenant that God made with Abraham. Now the thrust of the teaching about God, the thrust, the, the highway it's on, and the direction it's going, has got to connect with God's eternal purpose. Mm -hmm. It's got to tie in with that someplace. Now it's hard to make your emphasis marriage or children or something like that. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a hard time tying that in with an eternal purpose because there isn't going to be any marriage in heaven. Yeah, that's, right. that's, yeah. that's the first bottleneck you have right there. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yet God is going to require things of Abraham and his generations after him. All right, now his generations after him wasn't all people that came from Abraham. 
You know, the seed narrows down. I, I give a list from Abraham on. Particularly the generations come through. When he says your generations, this particular chosen generations, one out of many children from each, per, each, each person. So it's very selective. When he says your generation, it didn't mean everybody ever was a Jew. That's not what he meant. This, this, this postulates the absolute government of God. He's going to cause this to happen through Abram's, Abram's generations, which started with Isaac. Mm -hmm. Then it went to Jacob. I, to Jacob. Mm -hmm. then, it, then it went to the 12 tribes. Then of the 12 tribes, the Messianic lands went to Judah. Mm -hmm. he, it was very specific mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. how it went. Mm -hmm. And he said it would be an everlasting covenant. Now at this point, <clears throat> the concept of everlasting hadn't been established yet. The concept of everlasting is grounded on an everlasting God. This, now this had not been clarified yet. So when it says everlasting, it's not everlasting like you think of everlasting. That's not how he was talking. What he meant was, don't expect this to go away. This is going to be a permanent arrangement. But understand, these people did not have the idea of everlasting that we have. Well, some people today don't have a proper They can't think of everlasting. It's just, there's no, there's no lang human language that has a word that depicts that condition. It's all, it's a patchwork type definition for what it is. For instance, we read in scripture of an everlasting covenant. Canaan was an everlasting possession, everlasting hills, everlasting priesthood, everlasting statute, everlasting doors, everlasting remembrance, everlasting foundation, everlasting burnings, everlasting joy, everlasting sign, everlasting name, everlasting confusion, everlasting reproach. What do you mean when he said that? Back to them, he's schooling them in what it means for something not to end. It was a concept that had to be taught to the human race. Because they could only think in the context of time. Yeah, That's right, all they yeah. could think in context of. So this is like a divine educational mm -hmm. program. We read about everlasting kingdom and everlasting righteousness and the way everlasting and everlasting strength and everlasting salvation and everlasting kindness and everlasting light and an everlasting king and everlasting love and it picks up see as, as time proceeds it's, it's getting yeah. why are they called everlasting the bottom line is because they're connected with God so he's really not talking about duration he's talking about Permanency, which is a little bit, it's, it's a little bit different. It means you can count on this. You can, you can build on this, rock solid. Uh -huh. It's not going to pass away. Now I'll give you the land for an everlasting uh, possession. You say, what about at the end of the world? <laughs> well, I don't doubt that the new heavens and new earth will be has some similarity to the present heavens and earth. I don't question that that's possible. Mm -hmm. But again, the idea of permanency is what he's saying. He's not, the doctrine of everlasting is not the thing that he's establishing because that wasn't known to people yet. <clears throat> now the Lord had revealed the fact that I am that I am. That's a verbal pronouncement of eternality self-existent. Now I wanted to give you the the Believer's Study Bible with their definition of I am which is pretty good. I am who I am is a very literal rendering of the Hebrew text expressing God's real perfect unconditional de independent existence. God exists in a way that no one and nothing else does. He is without beginning or end. He is the only one being <coughs> who is self-existent. All other existence is dependent upon his uncaused existence. Jesus is the same as God. 
God is not the abstract being of Greek philosophy. Rather, he's the active, infinite, personal being who reveals himself as Redeemer and covenant-making Lord. He can only be defined in terms of himself. But he is revealed by what he says and what he does. God's name surely includes the idea of his continuing presence. The whole content of biblical history is a commentary on the meaning of this name. Well, it's another way. You see, you, you can see how difficult it is to mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> to open that up, but faith can take hold Amen. take hold of it right away. <laughs> yeah. It may not be able to give you a, a good rational explanation. You'll never be satisfied with how you define God. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. But faith can get hold of it. So, when he says, "I will be their God," he means in this capacity they'll depend on me. They'll rely upon me. See. I'll teach them enough to know you can't rely on the Egyptians. You can rely on me. Yeah. You, know, you can't rely on the Assyrians. You can rely on me. Amen. I'll be their God. Yeah. Now there's no such thing as a profitable association with God where God remains fundamentally unknown. Amen. And that's, an alarm, that's quite a statement. And it's an alarming statement to consider. Be, when you ponder how many people, it appears, are virtually ignorant of God. Now, you, you took note of this already. I know that immediately upon the change of Abram's name to Abraham, immediately the Spirit no longer calls him Abram. He's, that word is mentioned two other times after this book. One is First Chronicles one twenty seven, and the other is Nehemiah nine seven, and both of them are explaining his name was changed from Abram to Abraham. So he's never known mm -hmm. as uh, Abram anymore Amen. in Scripture. Now, when you come into Christ, you are to never more be known as you were before. Amen. Amen. And when you get your new name on the other side. Yeah. It'll just be like, that's the only reference. That's the only way you'll be referenced. Now, thou shalt keep my covenant, Abram. I was going to point out the token of the sign or seal of the covenant. That's what he's going to tell. Not the covenant itself. He's going to tell him. I'm going to give him a token. You've got to keep my token. Paul makes a point of the fact that the covenant was made prior to the commandment of the sign and the seal. As found in Romans 4.11. This I say that the covenant, which was confirmed before of God in, in, in Christ, the law which is 430 years after cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. And if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And later he tells him that he was he enjoyed the covenant before he was circumcised. So the token of the covenant and the covenant are not synonymous. The token was not Abraham's side of the covenant. Yeah, that's right. It was his token of it. And what was the token? Circumcision. Yeah. A humbling token, indeed. It was, you'll see it right away that at once this was a depiction of the circumcision of the heart. Uh -huh. <clears throat> now with the possible exception of Abraham himself, although the scriptures suggest he circumcised himself, this circumcision is performed by somebody other than you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The token of circumcision was known only to the one receiving it. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> you could look at Abraham in his everyday attire. Uh -huh. It's not the way it was. You had to have a kind of an understanding of his agreement with God before you knew this. Amen. And the circumcision was accomplished in a private part. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't your nose or your eyebrow or something like that, cheek. The mark of the beast. Forehead, right. hand. Yeah. <laughs> See, by the mark of God's covenant is unseen, yeah. and it was performed by. It could not be performed vicariously, like 
one person couldn't be circumcised for another person. That's right. Any person would be circumcised. Right. And then the part that was circumcised was separated from the person. Mm -hmm. Didn't stick it in his pocket. Yeah. That's right. Carry around with him. And it was a sort of thing that wasn't conducive to pride. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, you <laughs> Israel, by saying they were circumcised, boasted in it, but the, but the sign itself, it's not that kind of sign. Everyone who qualified for circumcision was required to be circumcised. You couldn't qualify for circumcision but not be circumcised. Oh, you qualified, you had to be circumcised. You're a male, eight days old, circumcised. Yeah. Every male of the household had to be circumcised. Once the covenant was in place, this had to be done eight days after the birth. You say, well, that's pretty early. I think the infant's kind of young. Eight days after the birth. Yeah. Every male who's not circumcised was cut off from the people. Now, there's a nature of God is revealed here. God will not allow for exceptions to his requirements. Mm -hmm. Now men try and create these. Some even try and base it on scripture. Mm -hmm. oh. Divine requirements are not varying. Amen. He can be circumcised, he doesn't have to be. He it's unvarying. God will not permit his people to continually ignore his word. He cuts off the ones, ones that don't. And he spells out the penalty for disobeying. Remember now we're talking about an eight-year-old child. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul should be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Well, among some of them might say that's mighty harsh. Well, if you're a father, it's important to know this. And Abram had to pass this down. This wasn't delivered in a book form to Abraham. Uh -huh. He had to orally pass this down. Don't forget. Yeah. Every man child. Yeah. Yeah, amen. You want God to be with you and to bless you? Mm -hmm. This has got to take place. Every man child. Now Paul mentions that some of the people were cut off, oh, whole generations, whole generations were cut off. He says some of them were cut off. And he's, they were broken off. But he says, You're, you stand by faith. You may be broken off too. If you think once you're in, you're always in. Oh. You abide there by faith. You'll be broken off too. This is Romans 11, 17-22. And Jesus, he talked about this. He said, my father's a husbandman now. He tends to the vine. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he <coughs> takes away. And men gather them and burn them so they're not like they just miss out on the rewards. Mm -hmm. Men gather them, they're burned. Now this, of course, is a foreshadowing of the circumcision of Christ. Uh -huh where the flesh is separated from the essential person. Mm -hmm. It's still in your body, your flesh, not this flesh, fleshly nature, mm -hmm. is in your body. Mm -hmm. But it's not part of you, it's been cut away. Amen. That's what you mean by circumcised. Cut. Yeah. Uh -huh. See, until you were in Christ, it was part of you. You would, and you were part of it, and it wasn't a thing you could do about it. Mm -hmm. Now you're born again. It's a kind of a technical point. You're born again. Here's this part mm -hmm. connected with your body. It's it's still there. It's, it'll be cut away, but it's not thrown away. Mm -hmm. It's crucified. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's where the parallel breaks down between earth, fleshly circumcision and spiritual circumcision. Mm -hmm. And fleshly circumcision, the, the part cut off died. Uh -huh. they remember when they came into Canaan, they hadn't circumcised the people yeah, that's right. for 40 years. And uh -huh. So they, they circumcised them. That was a hill of foreskins. <laughs> and eventually, I mean, that kind of dwindled away. But that's not the way the flesh is not that way. See, that's where the parallel breaks down. In circumcision of Christ, he separates it so it can be crucified. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
And it has to die this slow death. The death lasts as long as you are in the world. Amen. That's how long the death lasts. So if you were like in my case, you were, you were baptized in 1942, December 24th, 1942. I've been dying since then. That's right. My flesh has been dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they're giving us... It's good in a way because uh, God always keeps this before you remembrance that He had to do this for you. That's right. That this is something you couldn't do for yourself, but That's He right. could do it. Everyone can see this, I'm sure, that the circumcision of the flesh is essential to being saved. Whatever men may theorize about it, and when it takes place, and how it takes place, and all this, whatever men may theorize about it, this has got to take place, or a person cannot be saved, because this is what's set part of salvation. This is the self saved from part. Yes, amen. And his heart has to be circumcised. Yes. Circumcision is of the heart, mm -hmm. Paul said, of the spirit. Now the alarming implications of this are that if a person person's heart is not circumcised mm -hmm. they've broken the covenant yeah, that's right. they can't have covenantal benefits you may tell them confess your sins and God will forgive them but he won't yeah. he, I want to be emphatic about this he will not no he yeah. will not if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins but you forfeit that mm -hmm. if you live in the flesh you forfeit that Unless, unless you renounce the flesh. And that, of course, that's another, another matter. See, I don't believe this is commonly known. Yeah, the Word of God makes this pretty clear. He says, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. And First John 2.29 says, He that doeth righteousness mm -hmm. is righteous. So it's, this is defined in Scripture. Amen. So if you find a fundamentally unrighteous person, well, you've only got one conclusion you can come to. Mm -hmm. And Sarah's name is changed. Sarai, as for Sarai thy wife, mm -hmm. thou shalt not call her name Sarai. Sarah shall her name be. I will bless her. I will give thee a son also of her. Well, that's the first time he said that. Mm -hmm. That's the first time Abraham has heard that. Mm -hmm. That Sarah was going to bear the promised son. Mm -hmm. Since he'd been 75 years old, he's never heard that. Not one time. So if you think God doesn't test your faith... Yeah. <laughs> God tests your faith. One test of faith is God doesn't tell you everything. He just tells you enough to kind of hang on. So it wasn't mentioned a single time until this period when he was 99 years old. Not a single time did God even hint at this until he was 99 years old. So her name has changed. The meaning of Sarai is my lady, my princess. The Sarah means princess of a multitude. So before she was known as Abram, Abram's wife, that was my, my princess. Mm -hmm. Now she's princess of a multitude. Mm -hmm. It was a promise. Mm -hmm. It was a test of faith. And about this time next year, he said, it's going to happen. Now this is a picture of Christ who didn't have any generation. Who shall declare his generation, Isaiah said. He was cut off. No offspring. Well, not in the flesh he didn't have any offspring. But the 54th chapter of Isaiah, which follows Isaiah 53, says, Rejoice, O barren. Yeah. Enlarge the tent. The idea is that Jesus had more children than anybody else. Amen. Yeah. See? Yeah. Just like Sarah, when she was hopeless, had more children. Yeah. Had the child. Mm -hmm. The child. Previously, she said, and she probably, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. 
But she didn't say that after this. Yeah. And they evidently, I don't mean to mean crude, but they weren't right to work on this. Mm -hmm. He was 100 and she was 90. Yeah. If this, wasn't a, this was a miraculous birth in the sense of Sarah received strength, but yeah. from appearance it was a natural uh -huh. yeah. birth through the ordinary means. But, it, but God has made... It was hopeless in the flesh, and God made it happen. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? Now this text has uh, intrigued Bible scholars for many years. The fact that God didn't rebuke Abraham for doing this got my attention right away mm -hmm. and I felt this was a different kind of laugh yeah. so I, I checked up on some of the others and sure enough uh, it, 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 this has been thought all, all along okay. Augustine, Calvin, Dillich, mm -hmm. Keel, Murphy, Jerome, Chrysostrom, Calvin, Calvin, Wordsworth see these are people who lived a long time ago they all felt the same way that this wasn't a laugh of mockery. It wasn't the kind of laugh Sarah had. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't that. Actually, mm -hmm. one person said it pretty good. He said, this was the flesh suggested this, and Abraham cast it down. Mm -hmm. that, that was a pretty, <laughs> that was a pretty good. Well, you, you know that you have thoughts you can cast yeah, down, that's right. and you would object if someone gave you credit for the thoughts yeah, you yeah. cast down, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. You'd say, wait a minute. Well, wait a minute with Abraham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is the worst scenario. Yeah. But his name should be called Isaac, which means laughter. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what Isaac means. So I take it that this was a, a laugh of wonderment mm -hmm. versus of mockery. Yeah. And he did. He, it was a, it wasn't, he was a, is it possible that I... A hundred years old and Sarah 90 can have a child. Is this even possible? Rather, he was saying, could this have happened to even me? Yeah, yeah. That's, right. well, that's how I see this, uh, yeah. this laughter. Yeah. Then he immediately, he thinks about Ishmael. He loved Ishmael. Ishmael's 13. Mm -hmm. At this time, Ishmael's 13 years old. So Ishmael and Abram come, come to love Ishmael. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now there are, the different versions really present this in different ways. I'll, I'll give you some of them here. If only Ishmael might live under your blessing, that's the NIV, might live in your sight, New Revised Standard. If only Ishmael's life might be your care, basic Bible English. Why not let Ishmael be my heir? God's word. But let, but let but Ishmael live by your favor, New American Bible. May Ishmael live in your presence, that'll be enough, New Jerusalem Bible. Yes, do bless Ishmael, Living Bible. Why not let Ishmael inherit what you have promised me? Century Bible. I hope Ishmael will live and serve you, English Revised Version. Oh, keep Ishmael alive and well before you. See, so it's different... One is that Abram, Abraham was asking to let Ishmael live. As though maybe if the seed's going to be Isaac, maybe that's mean that God's going to take Ishmael out. Mm -hmm. Let Ishmael live. That Ishmael might live under God's care, but protect him. Mm -hmm. That Ab Abraham asked one verse, why not let Ishmael be the heir? Well, I think this is totally wrong. Or that Ishmael would live a life of service to God. So this, let me be clear, this is not a petition for Ishmael to be the heir. Yeah, that's right. Because God has categorically told him mm -hmm. the heir is going to be born by Sarah. And, God, and Abram has already shown us that he instantly responds to what God says. Mm -hmm. yeah. He does not plead for a lesser thing after a greater thing has been made known to him. Mm -hmm. I will bless her and give her a son. See, after God said that, it's inconceivable that Abraham would say, well, ignore that and give it to, give it to Ishmael instead. 
Why would anyone try to despise Abraham for praying for God's eye to be upon Ishmael? Some of us have wayward children. We still ask God to protect them. That's right. At least we do. <laughs> to give them a chance to turn around, this sort of thing. Now Sarah thy wife, notice how he says, yeah, Sarah thy wife, Sarah thy wife shall bear us, remember Hagar was given to him as a wife. Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son, I shall call his name Isaac. Now it's interesting how the different versions present this. <laughs> Here's several versions read, No, Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. American Standard Version, Nay. But that's rejecting what he said, see. Nay, but Sarah thy wife shall bear a son. Some versions say, no, but Sarah your wife shall bear a son. He ain't ever, he says, yes. <laughs> no wonder people get confused. Some versions say, no. Other versions say, yes. Yes, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son. Nevertheless, Sarah your wife. No, God replied, that isn't what I said. Sarah shall bear you a son. That's the living Bible. Yes, behold, Sarah your wife will bear you a son. Yea, behold, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son. Your wife Sarah truly shall bear you a son. That's not what I mean. Yeah. Your wife Sarah will have a baby, a son. That's the message Bible. Well, those really aren't Bibles. <laughs> you understand. But we know this is, we know he didn't reject him because he's going to say that he didn't reject his petition. I will establish my covenant with Isaac. Let's just be clear about this. I'm going to establish my covenant with Isaac. Now I've already shown you the generations that from Abraham on, on, but from Abraham back, there were chosen generations. Mm -hmm. They're listed here. Handpicked. Every one of them handpicked by God. You don't know any you don't know enough about these people to determine even if they were godly or not. Mm -hmm. All you know is they're in the lineage. Which is they're in the lineage because God remember he said the promise is to you and your generations. Mm -hmm. But they're they're not all your generations. It didn't mean all your generations. Mm -hmm. Is that what he meant? Met the ones that he appointed generations. Why? Because this genealogy leading up to Jesus. Mm -hmm. yeah. And God controlled that process all, uh, all along. Now this concept continues on into rather the salvation of God, which by revelation is associated with divine choice, mm -hmm. predestination, and election, and I gave you the text. God's associated salvation with these yeah. divine choice, predestination, and election. Mm -hmm. That's how you account for these generations back here. Mm -hmm. It's the only way you can account for them. Yeah. You can't account for them any other way. Amen. And uh, of course, Jesus himself is called the elect. Mm -hmm. He's called the elect. Jesus told his 12, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Yeah. And in his Gethsemane prayer, he acknowledged that God had given mm -hmm. these disciples to him. And then he says, that thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he might give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Mm -hmm. That's John 17, too. Now consider also that every leading person in Scripture was chosen by God. This includes men like Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, David, all the prophets. There is also the nation of Israel, specifically declared to have been chosen by God, without any qualifying merit on their part. This divine choice is associated with the progenitors of the messianic lineage, Seth, Enos, all the way down, Noah and his family, progenitors of Israel, like Moses, Aaron, or like Aram, Isaac, and Jacob, key men, like Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Solomon, all the prophets, John the Baptist, the parents of John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus, the mother of Jesus, the apostles, the church, individuals, see, all of them are connected with these 
attributes. So throughout scripture we're cultured to think of God as a chooser, one who elects and one who predestinates. And then God says, as for Ishmael, I've heard thee. I heard you, Abram. The meaning of heard is to hear with attention or interest. It means you're going to get what you ask for. Mm -hmm. I've heard you. I, I have blessed him already. I've, I've already pronounced a blessing on him. Yeah. And I'm going to make him fruitful, and I'll multiply him exceedingly, and twelve princes shall he beget, and I'll make of him a great nation. When it comes to my purpose, Abram, Abraham, when it comes to my purpose, it's going to be through Isaac. No benefit conferred upon Ishmael was outside the earth. Yeah. Amen. All had to do with the earth. Everything. Amen. But it was a blessing. In other words, he, he answered by caring for Ishmael while he was here, making sure he didn't starve to death and things like this. Now beginning with the case of Isaac, God establishes that everyone with fleshly roots to Abraham are not necessarily children. This is in Romans, the ninth chapter. Everyone that is of Abraham are not of Abraham. They're not the <laughs> he that says everyone that says they're a Jew, they're not necessarily a Jew. A Jew is one inwardly. Well, the same principle applies to the church. Not all if I speak say it this way, not all Christians are Christians. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a remnant within, mm -hmm. just like there was a remnant of the Jews. There's a remnant within the professed church as a remnant that are very real. Yeah. Now Jesus teaches us how to recognize them. Mm -hmm. He said to the Jews, first of all, he said, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So God sometimes can transfer the benefit to someone else. Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples. Then you'll know the truth. The truth shall make you free. He that is of God hears the words, hears God's words. John 8, 47. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They know me. John 10, 27. His sheep follow him for they know his voice. John 10, 4. So he gives you a means to identify who's who. But see, these these texts that I've just alluded to, these are all mysterious to the modern church. They really, they don't have a working knowledge of texts like this. So they'll say, well, that doesn't mean, were you saying that that means they don't understand? But this is really the way it is. And the apostolic doctrine, it delineates, writing to Christians, it delineates two different kind of people that may be in the professed church. They that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit mind the things of the spirit. That's written to the church. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That's written to the church. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh, together with the affections and lusts. It is the last time they went out from us, but they were not of us. But they went out from us, that it might be become evident they were not of us. See, so this condition has existed from the first century. That among those who say they're followers of Christ, there's a there's a remnant that really are, and there's some that are not. Yeah. And the idea of remnant is the bigger part are the knots. That's what the concept of a remnant is. A remnant of cloth, if you cut a patch out of a piece of cloth, you don't call the patch the cloth and the big part the remnant. That's right. The, the remnant is the... <laughs> so the remnant is smaller. So these qualifying statements, they are, they are not to be uh, glossed. Well, I, I'm going to conclude this rather rapidly. God left off talking. Says he went up. <laughs> I, just like, I just like the language. He left off talking and he went up. 
What do you learn from that? Well, something valuable to learn from that. God doesn't talk to me about everyday matters. He didn't hear. Mm -hmm. We don't have any record of him doing it. Mm -hmm. That's not the kind of conversations he holds. Yeah. There's certain things you've got to work out. Yeah. In the difficulties of life, you, you've got to work them out. Yeah. But if you want extended conversation with God, you do, want, do not want to limit yourself to personal associations that are in this world. Mm -hmm. God will talk to you about his eternal purpose and he'll open it up to you. But the rest of the things, you've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And you notice how thorough the obedience was. Mm -hmm. God said that every man child among you was to be circumcised. Abram was to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. Those born in his house was to be circumcised. Every man child in his house was to be circumcised. Any male bought with money was to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. And any male who is not circumcised would be cut off. Now the precision. Mm -hmm. Ishmael was circumcised. All born in his house was circumcised. All are bought with money was circumcised. And Abraham himself was circumcised. So it was very bright down to the letter. Amen. He did everything God said. Yeah. Now we've been exposed to the the faith of our father Abraham. I have a little chart here that tracks his life. He lived, he lived to be 175, the first 75 years. We don't know anything about him. So he walked with God for 100 years. That's probably second only to Enoch who walked 300 years with God. And I give it's this chart I tried to give a perspective of how his faith triumphed. He experienced a lot of hardships, different revelations at different times, but in the end his faith triumphed. Mm -hmm. And these appearances came at critical times. So, now the same will happen to you. As you live for the Lord You'll have high times that will come to you at strategic times when, they, when you need to have them. They're designed to keep your faith and your hope. Keep it going. And the objective is to reach the end of the life with your faith triumphant. Mm -hmm. That your faith might appear accepted when Jesus comes again. Or as one person said to arrive safely at the grave. At I want to stress that any faith that's not harmonious with Abraham's faith is spurious. Mm -hmm. It's not real. It doesn't make any difference what people say. We don't have to pay any attention even to what they say. Now the generation we're living in is the same kind of generation Jesus came and preached to. And it's similar in that it is a religious generation. Here's what he said to them. To what shall I like in this generation? It is like little children sitting in the marketplace who call to their playmates. We piped to you playing wedding, and you did not dance. We wailed dirges playing funeral, and you did not mourn and beat your breasts and weep aloud. In other words, this generation, if you don't give them what they want, they won't pay any attention to you. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you found this out. Huh? Maybe you found this out the hard way. And unless you give the people what they want, mm -hmm. they just write you off. Yeah. We live in that kind of generation. I'm personally of the opinion it's a rejected generation. Mm -hmm. That a remnant, a remnant of it will be saved. Truth has fallen in the street in this generation. But it isn't really any worse than the generation Abraham lived in because there was like no revelation there. At the end here, remember we're tracking first things that are happened in the book of Genesis. Through the 17th chapter, I've identified 192 things that took place for the first time. <laughs> 
See, God's teaching us. This is the... He's teaching us how to think mm -hmm. with God at the center of our thinking. I think I'm going to close there. Do any of you have a word you'd like to say? Well, I hope it was I hope it was plain. <laughs> Yes, Brother Paul. It seems such a small thing, but it really is a really big thing. It's at the moment that God told Abraham to say, say, your wife's name is now Sarah. The first thing that came out of his mouth was, and so Sarah bear a child? Yeah. And he heard her like, yeah. it slip. It wasn't an accident. Yeah. Yeah. So he purposely told That's her Sarah. right, good. <laughs> That's right. He adapted immediately what God said. That's a great secret. That's a great kingdom secret. I don't know I've ever connected it that he changed their names at the same time um, because they were they were one in this. Yes, amen. So he did it, he did it at the same time, and yet it, later he's gonna he's gonna talk to Sarah about it. But he, here, when he's dealing with Abraham, he deals he deals with them both in one as one. I like that. Mm -hmm. Yes, with a mic. Appreciate. Abraham's uh, spirit of do it right now. Yes. He, he makes adjustments right now every time yeah. God reveals something to him. That that was no small matter, circumcising all those men. But it, was, it was the same day that That's God right. spoke to him. Yeah. 318 at least. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know that it says God came to him early in the morning. It may not have been. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It been late afternoon. I mean. But he, he right then, it That's shows right. Abraham's desire to be a part of what God had said. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> had to have been more of a count of the men was years and years before that. Oh yeah. Had yeah. Sought them. And they were increased. They were increasing. Yeah. You know. And he was increasing all the time so it had to have been more than three, way, way more than 300. Yeah. <laughs> Ishmael's 13 years old. That's right. Amen. I thought about the same thing. Now he didn't have like he could go to them and say look I've got an open up a, any kind of paper. He had to go to him and tell him. <laughs> right. he, he quite a leader. Yeah. Oh uh, yes. He, Amen. They had to. He had to be. He was a spiritual leader. He, they uh -huh. knew he was a spokesman for God mm -hmm. to come and tell them this this kind of thing. Yeah, it's not right. like we're not going to eat any beans <laughs> the next week. He was talking about something yeah, that's that was going right. to get their attention. Yes. <laughs> oh yes. Go ahead. I was thinking in that too that how uh, Abraham demonstrated his faith to uh, to all these people because they had to see his faith. They had uh -huh. to, uh, like Brother Tony was saying, he was a spiritual leader, so so they had to see this faith that Abraham had too, and uh, and they they acted upon it yeah. too Amen. because obviously they didn't buck against what he said. Amen, Amen. Mr. Logan. I like how. When Abraham, Abram's name was changed to Abraham, how it can, we continue to call him Abraham, the yeah. one that the Lord gave him. And in Daniel, when um, Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah went to the king, the king changed his names. But as you continue to read, the Bible keeps their original names, not the one that the world mm -hmm. gave them. And I couldn't help but be reminded of the new name that we will receive as well. And the name that the Lord will give you is always more special than that of the world. Amen. 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 All right. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record of Abraham. We are coming to appreciate him more and more as the father of the, those who believe. We express our thanksgiving to you for his record in the scripture, and we are not ashamed of him nor of you who called him. In Jesus' name, amen.